to open God's Word with you, and um, just it's always a privilege. I'm always uh, a little nervous, and that's a good thing. Uh, I remember playing football for many years, and as many games as I played, for every game there was butterflies, there was a nervousness. I, Jason played a lot more games than I did. Sean played a lot more games than I did, but every game, right, Jason? And that's a good nervousness, and even more so, it's a good nervousness because of what we're getting ready to do. We're getting ready to look, work, get, look at God's Word, and God has given me the task, as um, confirmed by our elders, have asked me to do this, to, to, to take God's Word and open it up with you, and it, it's a tall task. It's a task that we have to trust God to help us with. And before we get to uh, this morning in God's Word, I just want to thank Chad Nugent last week, one of our elders here, that brought God's Word to us. I know Chad does not like attention. Uh, tough luck, Chad. One of my spiritual gifts is encouragement. So don't deprive me of using my spiritual gift. Um, and just uh, was encouraged, uh, Chad, by your word last week on time. And, and I would encourage you, if you're not here, to go to our YouTube page and, and listen to that. You would be encouraged and challenged, and I know it will help your walk with the Lord. So just, to, just thankful for that. Well, this morning we're continuing our series in Paul's first letter to Timothy in a series entitled Be Strong in Grace, as you can see there. And this morning is part six. There we go, part six entitled, Christ Jesus Came to Save Sinners. Christ Jesus Came to Save Sinners. Now, I don't know about you, but just the title fires me up. And, and, and just so you know, when, when I was told I was going to be preaching on this passage about four or five weeks ago, I've, I've been looking at this passage for four or five weeks and, and mulling over and, and studying it and stuff like that, and, and, and I'm more fired up uh, today than I was four or five weeks ago when I was given this passage. Just think about that title. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Um, well, I would invite you, if you have a copy of God's Word with you this morning, and I hope you do, to open it to 1 Timothy. That might be electronic, it might be paper, but 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, because I want us to look there together here in just a few minutes. Before we do that, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help as we study his word this morning. Lord, again, we come to you at this time of our time to worship together. We've been worshiping you through song, through prayer, or through uh, the celebrating of the Lord's Supper and proclaiming your death until you come. Uh, so Lord, now we come to our time to worship you through your word. And we realize, Lord, when we open your word, we look at it, we are at your mercy to help us understand what your word says, what it means, how we're to apply it, and then ultimately, Lord, when we walk out of here this morning, how we put it to practice. Lord, we're in your mercy. So we pray that you would open our hearts, you would open our minds, you would open our wills uh, to your word this morning and do what only you can do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the last time we were together, in 1 Timothy, a couple weeks ago, Jay taught verses 12 through 14 in 1 Timothy where we were challenged to be trustworthy messengers with the gospel. And remembering that the gospel, as we've been talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, in verses 3 and 4, says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That, that's the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And, and, and we looked at Acts 9, where Jesus appeared to Saul and struck him blind. And, and after this, we're introduced to a man named Ananias, if you remember, who was asked to do something very difficult. Jay talked about going through the, the book of Acts, and often you see people, they're just bold, and they're just taking on the world for Jesus. And nobody seemed to ever step back and say, well, I'm a little concerned about this, except Ananias. So maybe we can relate to Ananias. And, and God was asking him to do something really difficult. He was asking Ananias to go find Saul, who was well known for seeking out Christians to arrest them, to take them to trial for persecution. That's what Saul was doing. And he asked Ananias to go to this guy. Go for the guy who's look, go find the guy who's looking for you, who wants to put you in prison. I want you to go find that guy and share the gospel with him and commission him to my service. Now, I don't know about you, that I would have been a little scared. And Ananias was. He said, God, do you know about this guy? Of course, God did. And he said, yeah, I want you to go do this. 
And although he was reluctant, he obeys, he finds Saul and shares the gospel with him. And, and God this, did this because he knew Ananias would be trustworthy. He would be trustworthy servant to take the gospel to Saul. And God used the trustworthiness of Ananias to commission Saul, who would become the apostle Paul, to take the gospel to the known world at that time. And that's exactly what he did. And then we examined 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 14 in light of that past and discovered that God considered Paul to be a trustworthy messenger of the gospel and put him in charge of taking the gospel to the Gentiles in spite of Paul's violent past toward Christians and toward the church. Now remember that God did not entrust Paul with the message of the gospel because Paul in himself was so smart or trustworthy in himself. Instead, he entrusted him with the gospel and found him trustworthy solely because of the mercy of God. That's why he found him trustworthy. Not something within Paul, but something within God. The one true God who had mercy on Paul. And we were reminded that God has entrusted us with the message of the gospel, this good news. And considered us trustworthy to take that message to the world around us. And just like Paul... God doesn't consider us trustworthy because of something in us. He considers us trustworthy because he's merciful and he's gracious to empower us to take his message, his good news to the world around us. So by God's grace, may we be found trustworthy messengers of the gospel. Well, it's now, now time to look at our passage we're gonna look at uh, this morning um, in 1 Timothy. So if you'd stand with me and we're gonna read this passage together. 1 Timothy 15 through 17. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We always trust that God will use his word in our life as we read it together and look at it, so we're trusting that this morning. And before we dig into our passage this morning, I want to remind us that we're in a section of scripture, really verses 12 through 17. Jay began it a couple weeks ago. I'm going to finish it today. And it's a section where Paul is using his own personal testimony as an example of the true gospel that's by grace alone, through faith alone, to transform Paul's life. From one who was like verses 9 through 10, if you remember that, people who were sinners and lawless and rebellious and ungodly and, and unholy and profane, to transform Paul from someone like that to a follower of Jesus Christ. So he uses his own testimony, his own story about coming to know Christ to be an example of what God does for, with people like that when got, the gospel is applied to their life. And he does it in order to emphasize that it's only the true gospel. He says it's only the true gospel that can save and transform someone. And this is a contrast to the false gospel that was being shared, as we saw earlier in 1 Timothy. And, and what was happening is Judaizers were coming and they were saying, yeah, Jesus is good, all right, but it's Jesus plus doing the law, that's what will make you right with God. He said again, the Judaizers we're coming say, hey, Jesus is okay, but you, you need Jesus, but you also need to convert to Judaism, and you also need to keep God's law before you can be made right with God. And Paul's saying, no way. When you add anything to the finished work of Jesus Christ, it's a subtraction, not an addition. You're just taking yourself away from God's one true gospel, because then it's not by grace. Then it's by your works. Then you can stand before God and say, you know, God, I appreciate Jesus and all that. He died on the cross, rose again. That's all real well and good, but I did a lot of good things, didn't I? Aren't you glad to have me? We know from Ephesians 2, 9, it says he did it so that no one can boast. We're saved by his grace, not by works, not by what we do. And Paul's saying, hold on, that's not the true gospel. Is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. 
I, I, I pulled out a pen. I really didn't have a place to put it, but one of my mentors, a guy who influenced my life more than anybody else, uh, the, outside my dad, was a guy named Bob Warren, played in the old ABA for the San Antonio Spurs, and I met him at a college retreat at an FCA event when I was in college, and he poured, in, uh, poured into my life until uh, about five years ago when he went to be with the Lord, but he had, we had these pens. Somebody made these pens up for his funeral, which I had the privilege to officiate, and we wore them on our lapels. It says, Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing. We need Jesus. That's the true gospel, and Paul's saying, and the true gospel will transform your life. But when you begin to hook yourself up to the law and try to make yourself right by doing good things, you'll never be good enough. You'll never be good enough. So he's showing what it looks like when the true gospel grabs hold of your life and makes you a child, not a slave. Well, as we consider the main point of this passage this morning, I, I want to share with you briefly about a phone call I received a little over 10 years ago from a former college football teammate of mine. His name is Darren. Uh, Darren Amberge. Uh, I was sitting in my study in our home in Texas. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what I was doing, and I got a phone call, and I looked on my phone at that time. It was probably like the iPhone minus seven. I'm not sure exactly what it, the way it came out by then, but, but I had, and I could see this. And I see it leaves a number from Ohio, and I didn't know who it was, but I answered it. Now, if I don't know who, what a number, whose number is now, I don't answer it anymore. I've learned that trick, all right? It's gotten really bad. But so I saw it, but I went ahead and answered. It's from Ohio. I said, hello, and, and, greeted, and was greeted with this voice. Hello, Brian. This is Darren Amberge. You probably don't remember me, but I played college football with you. I said, no, Darren, I do remember you. Man, how's it going? Great to hear from you. And he proceeded to tell me, I'm just calling to let you know that I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I'm a follower of Jesus now. And my whole family has come to know Christ. And I wanted to thank you, Brian, for standing up for the gospel and God on our football team when I was in college. And by God's grace, I've received three or four of those kind of calls of you know, men and guys that I played ball with over the years. And so thankful for that. And I, and I rejoice with Darren. We got to catch up a little bit and was so thankful to hear that God had changed his life. See, Darren was pretty typical of the guys that I played college football with. Uh, um, and he was pursuing the lust of the flesh that are so readily available when you're out of your home and no one's telling you what to do. And he was pursuing the lust of the flesh like many of my teammates were at that time. And yet now he was calling to tell me that God had rescued him from the penalty of his sin and made him right with him. Should I have been surprised by this news from Darren? So my response was, oh, you've got to be kidding me, not Darren Amberg. Of all people, are you kidding me? And there were some other guys on the team that partook more of, the, of the, the, the lust of the flesh than Darren did, but should that have been my response? Well, not if I believe the main point of our passage this morning, which is this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I shouldn't have been surprised. Isn't that why Christ came? to save sinners. In fact, I, every time I hear of someone coming to Christ that I've known in my past, I shouldn't be surprised. I should be, well, yes, of course. That's exactly why Jesus came. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm gonna say that so many times today, you're not gonna forget it. All right, because I don't want you to forget it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and when we see him work in the lives of other people and they come to faith in Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be go, I can't believe that. We say, Well, of course. When we've seen him work in our own life, we shouldn't go, Well, I can't believe that. Of course, that's what Jesus came to do. Well, with that said, Let's now examine more closely our passage here this morning. And in order to do that, I want us to ask and answer four questions that will help us better embrace the truths found here so that we might have a deeper love for God in this gospel. So I'm, we're going to ask four questions. I'm going to go ahead and give all four of them to you up front. Real question, real quick. They're not real long. And remember, I, I've been hitting the head a lot playing football, so I don't make them too long, so I don't have to remember too much, all right? So here they are. We're going to answer the question, who, what, why and now what? You, 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 are you all with me? We got that. All right, good. All right. So, and before we answer, um, oops, 
Let me go back here. Before we answer these four questions, look with me at the, at the beginning of verse 15. Notice there it says, I've got highlighted, it is a trustworthy statement. Some of your translations may say it's a trustworthy word. This statement is found five times in the New Testament, but only in what we call the pastoral epistles, which are 1 Timothy three times, 2 Timothy once, and Titus once. It's the only time this, this phrase, it is a trustworthy statement, appears in all of the New Testament. Uh, the, the, these trustworthy statements or faithful statements seem to be a quote of a well-known statement of they by Christians and, and possibly coming from a hymn or an early creed that they would memorize to, 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 put, to, put, to put to memory big truths in a short way. All right? We might call them pithy statements. They were statements which, which people would be familiar with. So, so help me with this. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. And somebody told me I was dating a girl in high school and went off to college, and they said, you've heard the phrase, absence makes the heart grow fonder? I said, yeah. They said, well, let me add to that. Absence makes the heart grow fonder for somebody else. All right? And, and I'm thankful that absence made the heart grow fonder, and I found my wife. So here's another one. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. All good things must come to an end. You got it. All that glitters is not gold, and if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You got it. Those are all th these kind of statements. They're, they're trustworthy statements that we've memorized, we've heard. I've got some other older ones, and I wasn't sure who would get that. Some of my grandmother used to say I never understood, um, but, but they, they help us remember big truths. They, they, they summarize big truths into what they, we, little statements. All right, and, and that's what Paul is saying. He's using a statement they would be familiar with. You, you've heard this before, he's saying. This is a trustworthy statement. And, and, and the use of the word trustworthy or faithful emphasizes the fact that this statement is a faithful presentation of God's message. You can trust this. This is from God. It's faithful in contrast to the speculation of the false teachers that we saw. They speculate this is trustworthy. It's different. And, and and, and the, see the, notice the next phrase here um, in our passage, deserving full acceptance. Paul is saying you need to take this statement seriously. Listen up. This is important. Do you ever remember someone in the class asking this question, maybe when the teacher was teaching something or a professor was teaching something, they asked this question, is that going to be on the test? Or maybe you were that person, right? Hey, is that going to be on the test? Is it worth me even listening to or writing down? Well, here's what Paul's saying. This statement I'm getting ready to give you, it's going to be on the test. You better write it down. It's serious. Write this down. It will be on the test. That's how important it is. That's what he's saying here. It's deserving full acceptance. That trustworthy statement is this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Can you say that with me? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I want us to be able to say that just like we can say when we fail to plan, we plan to fail. Or any of those other things we all knew. We should know this one. This is a trustworthy statement that can change our life. Well, let's now ask and answer the very first question of our passage this morning. And that is the who question. Look with me in verse 15 at the words Christ Jesus in the beginning of this phrase. The word Christ there is, is the promised Messiah, right? In Genesis 3, 15, right after Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God, God promised he would send someone who would take care of the sin problem, the problem that had separated God from mankind. He says, I'm gonna send someone who will take care of that problem. In Genesis 3.15, we find that. He's going to save you and take care of the power and the penalty and ultimately the, the, the presence of sin. The word Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah, all right, which we become, it came to mean the promised anointed one who is sent from God the Father to conquer sin and death. All right, so it's the word Christ. The other word here is Jesus. And the word Jesus um, is also found in the Old Testament, the word Joshua, which Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. It, it, Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ wasn't his first and middle name. They, they had something, Jesus was his name, but he was given that name because it was his calling. He came to do what? To save, 
to save sinners. That's why he was named Jesus. So we have this Christ Jesus. The who then, the answer to our who question, is Christ Jesus, the fulfillment of God's promise to conquer sin. I mean, this statement is full, just full of depth, full of power. And you think, we're gonna take a, it's going to take a long time to go word for word on this. We've got two more verses after this. We'll speed up. Don't worry. All right, but we can't miss this. Who? Christ Jesus, the promised one, who God promised would take care of the sin problem. When we read that, it ought to jump off the page. Christ Jesus, that's the who. Well, let's now ask the second question of our passage this morning. What? What did he come to do? Well, he came to, save, to, came to the world to save sinners. Look there in verse 15. Uh, some translations say coming into the world. All right, he came into the world. I'm just gonna, this is, we're not going to dwell on this, but listen, he came into the world. What's that say about Christ Jesus? He was pre existent. He was pre existent. He came into the world because he already existed. And he came and he took on flesh and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as only, only begotten, full of grace and truth, as it says in John 1.14. This is who this is, and he came into the world. The world is the place where sinners live and need to be redeemed. It also has the idea of this, this system, this world system that's against God, when, especially when, when John uses this word world. It's the world system who's against God. It's not the physical planet necessarily, but it's the people who need to be redeemed in that world. And then he came to save. It means to rescue from the penalty of sin to a new life of faithfulness in God's service. The fact that Christ Jesus came to save emphasizes a contrast with the false teachers who were promoting keeping of the law as the means to be made right with God. I love what a writer named John Stott uh, says, an old British guy, says when he writes about this. The law is meant for the condemnation of sinners, the gospel for their salvation. Say that again. The law is meant for the condemnation of sinners, but the, law, but the gospel was for their salvation. Now notice the last word in that phrase that tells us what he came to do. Sinners. Who, who's sinners? We're just talking about sinners. I mean, it can't be any of us, can it? Could it be us? I don't know. He said sinners. Who, who is that? Well, just let God's word speak to us. And you've heard this one before, Romans 3, 23. Some, some have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? That's what it says. Some have sinned. Did I miss one? Oh, all, thank you, all. And, and this is a joke, and hopefully you get it. You know what all means in Greek? All. Yeah, all. You can't get around it. It means all. Every single last one has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not some, but all. And that sin, the missing of mar the mark or God's standard he, that he has set out, is highlighted by the fact, listen, that we fall short of the glory of God. And Isaiah 43, 7 says that God created people from all, all facets, all corners of the earth, all people, from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. He created them for his glory. That's why he created us, was for his glory. What does it mean? I shared this last night with the youth. What does it mean to glorify someone? It means to put them on a pedestal and say, man, look at them. They're awesome. That's what we do as sports heroes sometimes. We're supposed to glorify God. He says, glorify me. That's why I created to make much of me because in making much of him, we find fulfillment. And what do we do? We fall short of the glory of God and we put ourselves on the pedestal and say, hey, look at us. And we glorify ourselves. The height of sin and pride. We all fall short of the glory. We've all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God because we make much of ourselves. We've all sinned. Jesus made it clear that this is what he came to do over and over and over again in his ministry here. Just a couple of examples in Mark 2.17. Listen to what Jesus said. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came, to save sinners like us. Now, now look with me at the last phrase there in verse 15. Among whom I am foremost of all. 
or some translations, among whom I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and Paul offers himself as an example of Jesus saving sinners. Hey, he came to save sinners like me. Earlier in chapter 1, in verse 13, Paul says he was formerly a, a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. And in Galatians 1.13, he says he was trying to destroy the church. This was Paul. And surely you go, well, yeah, he's got a pretty bad resume. I mean, Paul's a sinner for sure. Unbelievable. Look at that. He should call himself the foremost, the chief of sinners. Paul was no doubt a sinner. In fact, he says he was the foremost, the worst of sinners. Paul understood that before he was in Christ, he was the worst of sinners. Now, when you think of someone, think of the foremost, the worst of sinners in human history, who comes to your mind? When you think of the foremost or the worst of sinners, the worst of sinners, who comes to your mind? You know who comes to my mind? Listen real, really closely here. This is who comes to my mind. The person that comes to my mind when I think about the foremost or the chief or the worst of sinners is me. Me. You think, holy cow, Brian, what'd you do? Well, I didn't have a resume like Paul. But when you truly understand your sin, whatever it is, in light of a holy God, you'll consider yourself the foremost of sinners. When you realize what he saved you from. Now come on, Brian, you're being a little hard. No, I'm not. We'll never understand the grace until we understand the depth of our sin. And just one, just one, just one sin. You see, before we place our trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to pay for our sins and make us right with God, we were all relying on the law, the works, what we did to make ourselves right with God, to gain God's favor. All of us were in some fashion. You may not even realize it, but you were. And I'm telling you, that's futile. James, James 2.10 says, Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of all. Let me say that again. Whoever keep, keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point. There's 613 laws in the Old Testament. We, we did 612 of them right, and we missed one. We're guilty of all? How does that work? I didn't do the other 612. I mean, I got them all right. Here's how it works. So let's say that I'm going to pick Jason because I kind of trust Jason. All right. Let's say I'm, I'm hanging over a cliff, and Jason's got a chain link. He's got a, a big chain that has links in it. He's holding on to that chain. I'm hanging over a cliff, and if I go, if I go down, if he lets go, I'm in trouble. And I, Jason's pretty strong. He'd probably handle me. All right. And, and he's pulling up, and, and I look up, and I start to see when the links start to separate a little bit. And it separates a little bit more, and separates a little bit more, and all of a sudden, that one link breaks. What do we say about the chain? The chain broke. Not the link broke, the chain broke. And I was relying on that chain, and J Jason holding on to that chain for my salvation from death. And if we're relying on one part of the law, one part of the law, if we break one part of that law, what do we say about what we did to the law? We broke the law. We broke it all. It's all worthless then. Does that make sense? So we can look at ourselves and say, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And think about the worst sinner you can think of. It should be you. It should be me. And when we understand the depth of that, we'll begin to truly understand how great his salvation is. Are we able to say with Paul that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I'm foremost of all? I hope so. Now let me make a quick point here. We don't have time to really dig into it. Paul is pointing to his life, context tells us, pointing to his life before he knew Christ. Because he points, he, in this context, he's already said, man, I was this and I was terrible and I was a violent aggressor and all those kind of things. I was the foremost of sinners, he's saying. And his identity is no longer a sinner but a saint, a child of God, a new creation, who still sins, yes, but his identity has changed. This is true of all of us who are in Christ by faith. Yes, we, we got a new identity. We still sin. But our identity is not the old person. We're a brand new creation. If you hear when Jay taught through Ephesians, we learned that. Our identity has changed. So let me make that clear. We're not still at our core sinner. We're at our core because we have a new spirit, a new heart. 
the new creation who sins. Yes, we sin. Well, let's, let's now ask and answer the third question of our passage this morning. And that question is the why, and we're going to do this. Why did, Jesus, why did Christ Jesus come to the world to save sinners, and specifically Paul? Look with me at verse 16. Yet for this reason, all right, for this reason I found mercy. Uh, th- it's interesting that this word mercy literally reads this way. I was mercied. I was mercied. It's, it's, it's in the, this thing called the passive voice, meaning he was acted upon. The NIV says, I was shown mercy. Another translation says, I received mercy, which I like better than this translation here. Because Paul wasn't looking for mercy, I promise you that. We found him on the road to Damascus. He was working, look, looking, to, looking to kill people like us. He wasn't looking for mercy. Mercy found him. God initiated the mercy in, his mercy in his life. The phrase, for this reason, points forward to the the so that in our passage, um, giving the specific purpose for which Christ showed mercy to Paul. Look with me there. It says, so that, well, go back here. So, yeah. So, there it goes. So that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ, listen to this, might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Jesus' patience is put on display by showing mercy to Paul. Jesus, in a sense, he's not glorifying Paul, but he's saying, hey, if you, if you ever read the, the, the book of Job, God says, consider my servant Job. All right, when he's talking to the enemy. And here he's saying, consider my servant Paul. Look what I did to him. Look at the mercy I gave Paul. Look at him. Look at Paul. Look what I did in Paul's life. That's why he's an example for those who would believe. And I love... It's patience in delaying God's judgment, and Paul calls it perfect patience. Notice that. He says God's perfect patience. It has this idea of utmost, to the utmost, patience to the utmost. So think about this. Jesus showed the utmost patience for the foremost of sinners. Let me say that again. Jesus showed the utmost of patience for the foremost of sinners. Because that's what he needed and that's what we need. He did this as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Those who would believe. And this belief, this this faith is a recognition of the claims of Christ and a personal trust in him. That's belief, not just a mere intellectual assent to some facts about Jesus at the back of his baseball card. But yes, we need to know what he did. But we're put a personal trust in what he did on our behalf. That's biblical faith, biblical belief. And we're given this thing called eternal life. I love this, this, de- 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 uh, this definition. I'm going to read it so I don't get it, get it wrong. Supernatural life belonging to God and Christ, which believers will receive in the future, but which they also enjoy here and now. It's not just out there. It's now. We're, we, we, it says in John, we have eternal life, not will have eternal life. And this is eternal life that we know the true God and, the, and your son whom you sent, John 17. Both quantity, all right, way out there, and also quality. Both length and depth, that's eternal life. Let's answer this question again, the why question. Why did Christ Jesus come in the world to save sinners, and specifically Paul? If God can save Paul, the foremost of sinners, he says, he can save anyone who believes. That's the point here. Paul said, man, if God can do this to me, you've got hope. He can save you too. If you're here this morning, you think you're too bad for Jesus, you're wrong. You're not too bad for Jesus. I've sat down with men many times. Brian, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand what I've done. I take him this passage right here. Hey, God died for sinners. He sent Jesus. Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners like you and like me. You see, God through Jesus has been saving sinners all through history, even those we sometimes consider the worst sinners of all. Maybe some of those people, be honest with me, some of those people that you thought of when I asked you to think about the worst of sinners, right? The Hitlers, the Pol Pots. How about the Putins? Of our world. Maybe that's who came to your mind right now. You know what? Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. 
to save sinners. And he's been about it the whole history. So let me just perf- briefly tell you about one of those times in history when God, through Jesus, saved sinners. I saved a sinner who many would consider one of the worst of all. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And we find him in, in God's, God's saving work in his life. It takes place in Daniel 4. And you think, that's the Old Testament. How did Jesus have anything to do with that? Hey, just to remind you, all people of all time, Old Testament, New Testament, are saved the exact same way. It's by faith alone in Christ's promised Messiah. They were saved or made right with God by looking forward to what Christ, that God had promised in Christ. And those of us who are on the other side of the cross, we look back and we're saved by faith in the same Christ who died in the past. It's by faith alone, in Christ alone, it's always been that. Always. So that's what it has to do. That Nebuchadnezzar, was, he was made right with God in the same way. So Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon when the nation of Israel, specifically the southern kingdom of Judah, was in captivity in Babylon. And, and they were being disciplined for their rebellion against God. God had warned them. The northern kingdom had gone off in the, to captivity uh, in 722 B.C. And he said, hey, look what I did to your brothers. And they didn't listen, didn't learn. And then in 605 and 597 and 586, They were taken captivity in Babylon for their rebellion against God. And many know the story in Daniel 3 of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace. You all remember that story? Man, that's one of those exciting stories. Like Daniel's in Daniel Daniel and Lion's Den, which comes later in Daniel. Fired up about that. No pun intended. All right. But just a great story about the fiery furnace. At the end of that incident, Nebuchadnezzar is impressed with the power of God. And he's like, whoa, man, there was like another guy in the fire and all that. And you came out and... Your clothes were in your scent. Oh, man, that's some God. He's super impressed. And, and he's so impressed that he says, if anyone speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they'll be torn limb from limb and destroy their house. Well, you better be careful what you say around Nebuchadnezzar, right? Especially if you're going to say something about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And sometime later, Nebuchadnezzar must have forgotten of how great that one true God was, and he began to think a little more highly of himself than he should. God decided to visit Nebuchadnezzar with a dream. He didn't understand it, so he called all the wisest men in Babylon and said, man, I got this dream that I had, and I can't figure it out. Can you help me? And they're like, "Ah, man, sorry. And he even gave them the good dream. They couldn't figure it out. So then Daniel stepped up, and by God's power, interpreted the dream for the king. The message of the dream was not good, and it showed that Nebuchadnezzar had basically set himself up to be God, and, was going, and God was going to chop him down like a tree and make him crawl on the ground like an animal and eat grass for seven years. How would you like to have a dream like that? And then somebody come along and say, hey, and, and you're the star of the dream. That's what Daniel did. Daniel then warns the king after he interprets his dream with this, and Daniel Chapter 4, verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be accepted to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. He says, repent. Nebuchadnezzar does not take Daniel's great advice here. And just as God promised, Nebuchadnezzar is taken off the throne. He crawls around like he loses his mind in a sense. Crawls around like an animal eating grass for seven years. For seven years, just like God had promised him. And then Nebuchadnezzar gives us testimony of what happened after that seven years. And we see this in the last three verses of chapter four of Daniel. Let me read those so you can read along with me. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his kingdom is an everlasting dominion, and all his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Sounds like he's changed his tune. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or, or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor restored to me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, I, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. He no longer was the God of, she I emphasize that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Go. Now he was the God of Nebuchadnezzar. And God had changed his heart, just like he did Paul. 
And we could offer Nebuchadnezzar an example of some of the worst that we could think of. And God changed him because Christ Jesus did what? He came into the world to save sinners. Let's now ask the last question of our text this morning. And we find this in the question is now what? What do we do now that we understand the trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost? Well, look with me in verse 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God to be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. After explaining and contemplating the amazing grace of God in sending Jesus into the world to save sinners, including him, Paul, Paul can't help himself but to give glory to God. I mean, it's just welling up inside, and he just whoa, he just lets it out. That's, that's what happened here. That's, that's the way we're meant to read this. Oh, my gosh, what, what do I do? Well, this is all I can do. I can give him praise. J.I. Packer, in his classic book, Knowing God, makes the following profound statement. When I read it the first time in 1997, when I read the book for the first time, and then again in 2004, and I read it again, and I probably need to read it again. This profound statement about how people respond when they truly understand the grace of God. Listen to this with me. There have always been some who have found the thought of grace so overwhelmingly wonderful they could never get over it. There have always been some who have found the thought of grace so overwhelmingly wonderful they could never get over it. And Paul was one of those who found a thought of grace so overwhelmingly wonderful, he could never get over it. Therefore, he couldn't help himself but to burst out in praise to the God that had given his son for him. And as maybe you can tell, I'm one of those people that once I found out this thought of grace and I understood it was so overwhelmingly wonderful, I can't get over it. I can't get over the grace of God. Are you one of those people? Have you found that the grace of God, this thought of grace was so overwhelmingly wonderful that you, you can't get over it? You can't get over his grace? If so, then, then join with me in praise and adoration of God by exclaiming together this last part. Let, let's say this together. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I mean, this truth just makes me want to sing. And I'm not much of a singer. But it makes me just burst out in song. That's what happens. A lot, of, a lot of guys, we don't sing. Hey, I guarantee you had a song for your girl when you were dating her in high school. I'm telling you. Every guy's got a song for the girl. And you sang that and some of you were singing some Lionel Richie and just letting it roll. That dates me, all right? And you were, but when it comes to God, when it's God's, we're too tough to sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's what it makes you want to do. He's worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. If that kind of God did that for us, foremost of sinners, he's worthy of that. He's worthy of the, from the depths of our soul to sing out to him. He's worthy. Well, let's not only praise God with our lips, but let's praise the Lord with our lives in worship by taking the message of the gospel as trustworthy messengers to the world around us. Well, in order to help us to prepare to apply this truth in these verses, I wanted to ask you to think of someone who you know needs to hear this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Can you think of somebody who needs to hear that message today? And, and now I want you, if you, if you got a pen or, or your phone and you can put it in notes, I want you to write down or put in your, in your notes Write down the name of that person you just thought of who needs to hear that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. R write them down. Then commit to pray for that person every day. Every single day. And see what God does. And then commit when that opportunity, when God presents that opportunity to share this message, share the message that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. With that person. 
If you think they're too bad, if they think they're too bad for God to save them from their sin, take them this passage. If they don't think, don't think they're bad enough to need salvation from sin, take them to this passage. In conclusion, let's read our passage of Scripture together again this morning. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Would you stand with me as we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you that this is not one of those passages that we scratch our head and, boy, what does that mean? Lord, I pray we would be overwhelmed like Paul, that you sent your son, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like us. And people all over this world who are here and need to hear that message, Lord, I pray we would be faithful stewards, trustworthy messengers of your gospel of the truth that Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Lord, help us do that this week. That, those names we thought of, those names we wrote down, Lord, make us faithful to pray for them, for you to intervene in our life, and then for to take the opportunity to let them know that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Lord, help us be faithful with the gospel by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. One is a way to encourage us with the truth this, the, of here, this, this main truth this morning. I want you to turn to someone. See if you've been listening. Turn to someone and say, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Can you turn to somebody and say that to them?